Ruiz. Welcome back to the next part of this Truth and Rhythm episode. Be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. Also become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you so much for your interest and support. Enjoy. So you must have been caught pretty off guard then knowing all that when this took off and was such a hit. I had no idea it was a hit um, for about six months because I, I, I was in studio um, doing what I did. Be, I left. I, I can't say I left the, uh, the Mahavishnu Orchestra. It left me. I was fired. Um, and I didn't get a chance to cash my last check. Uh, so um, what did I do? I decided in answering your question to open, to start a band of my own when I had Spectrum because I was told that I had a hit and I had no idea it was one. Uh, I was in a recording studio when musicians in the studio with me, colleagues of mine, um, Don Rolnick or Coriel or so I said, man, this is a great record you made. And I'm thinking and it could be Jackie and Roy or it could be Esther Phillips or as to Merrill, uh, all these different, you know, Carmen McCurry. Oh, you mean this? And, no, man, your record. I'm going, I made a record. Yeah, sure. But that was me and Jan and, and Tommy. And we were just hanging. Um, nah, you know, I, I had enough money. I, I could afford Joe, Joe Farrell and, and Jimmy Owens through the union. And Ron was the bass player. And Sklar was coming through town, so it, but it was just all one of those things. And yeah, it was over at Hendrix's place. It was like kind of family kind of thing. Nothing, nothing that was just, no one took me seriously, I thought, you know, at that time. And, and it, was, it was, in terms of cost, very cheap because I had it all kind of organized. I'll go in at this amount of time. I'll get. I'll commit to this amount of time, and we'll do X, Y, and Z, and then we'll we'll mix in this amount of time with with Ken Scott, and everything will be done. Everybody gets paid, and it's done. Goodbye. And I'll give one to my mom and dad, and then I'll give one to my brother. And that was it. Next thing you know, this record is number thirty-one with a bullet, and I'm going get out of here. That's that. I mean, when I hear about this, I'm going. Now I got to look billboard. What me? I don't think so. And it's true. Okay, now we got to go with it. Uh, but I'm told, you need a band. Oh, my God. Now I get scared. But I know bands cost money, and I don't have any. And so how am I going to do this? So I go to all the guys that I knew that were in bands. We were in bands together before. So that ends up being Randy Brecker and Michael Brecker, and, um, Glenn Ferris, uh, Alex Blake, Mr. Levia. Uh, the pastoral, you know, we just threw all of this thing together. We rehearsed a little bit, and we went. I had a friend who was a a partner in Rocketball with me. His his name was um, Michael Epstein. And his father had a at a club in Long Island called My Father's Place. I said, I called Epi. I said, man, I need a couple of days just to got a band together. Yeah, come on up. I think we played for a song, you know. And I was so nervous. That was when I got nervous. It was when I and so we had a was supposed to play for 90 minutes. And I swear everything we played that was prepared for 90 minutes, timed and everything in in rehearsal hall. You know, I played it in a half an hour. I mean, it was like it was so fast, everything was so fast. It was like 
we were on steroids. It was me, you know, everything was, bang, done. Place is jammed and I'm going, I'm glad that's over. <laughs> we had to do it again, <laughs> twice. Because I didn't play long enough. All of this you learn. It's a very interesting experiences. <laughs> you know, and <clears throat> how do you feel that you developed, you know, all these other skills like the composition and the arranging? Because, you know, there's a lot of great drummers, but not all of them expand so much into those areas as, as you have. Um, I've been blessed with a lot of a lot of really wonderful, supported colleagues. I mean, not without four letter words that came my way in 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 droves. I mean, in, in dozens. What what the were you doing? You can't write like this. What you idiot? You know, blah blah blah. Uh, until I learned. <laughs> These are the things you don't forget. Uh, not to put down school, but I, what I was getting in real time was the real school after I went to the school that pre would have prepared me for that, you know, where a teacher said, no, Bill, you know, you, you know, you got to, this is a chord and this is a major chord and this is a minor chord and here are the modes and blah, blah. No, no, no. This was all at the same time for years. I'm still going through it, man. You know, I'm no, I'm I'm far from perfect, but I hear things now. But I hear it in in multi-dimensional ways, so for lack of a better term, um, it's a lot happening at the same time. But I can hear what and where and how it, how things change and where we go. I mean, that this is something where the music goes. This is something that I can envision without having to write it down. This is something that I, I don't play a piano on. I just write it, and uh, it may be now on my computer, so I, I have have the 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 ability to just listen as I'm writing what's happening. I'm saying, no, I don't want to. And let's change this, you know, and, just, and it just happens. I don't have to talk about. It. it takes me a while, yes, as it always did. I feel very comfortable. With it. I feel like maybe some of your analytical or precise abilities was in your DNA, maybe from what you said about your father, you know, mm -hmm. and his. He just did it. He had a he had a brother um, who was given the the assignment in the family as the oldest son to play music, but in the church. And that was his thing, and to be a teacher. That's what my grandfather told my fa my father and my my uncle. Um, um, and so his younger brother was my father, and my father was a given the assignment. Said my grandfather said, "You, you will study academics." And you will be the scientist, which my father ended up being. Yeah, I feel like you're a scientist of music. You know the way you approach it. Yeah, but um, but yeah, he just he just would. My father wanted to play like his brother, so he would stand by the door when when their father wasn't looking, and look and watch. And the old and, and my my uncle Edwin would show him on the piano and my father would not read the music my uncle Edwin would read the music my father would remember and then sit down at somebody else's piano and play it because mm -hmm. the way he heard his brother play it. the funny thing is he never changed key he always played in F sharp or G flat. And the strange thing about me is that I tend to lean towards F sharp or G flat when I write. And then I transfer the keys because I don't want to write. If you notice, check out Spectrum, it's in B. You know, it's like all the black keys. It's for some bizarre reason, that's how, and it comes out this way with us. It's not, a, it's not in B flat. 
it can be natural. Um, be 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 minor. I mean, it's just like, and I often wonder to myself, yeah, it wasn't in C, which is no flat. It wasn't in B flat. It was B minor, you know. But this uh, this is the way we heard. It. Did you have any clue when you laid it down that Stratus would be, you know, basically like a classic? No. The big thing for me was that I wasn't writing to make a hit. I was desperate to, to this was a calling card. It's an LP that said, yeah, I can do this. That's why you have Lily um, to the women, which is an introduction uh, to that. Now, it's just a ballad. Uh, or you look at, look at the shuffle. It was a different kind of thing with quadrant four. You know, Tori Matador is the only, but aside, no, that's not true. Tori Matador has a couple seven, seven, eight bars or four, seven, eight bars in it or something like this uh, inside there. But generally it's an up-tempo thing, mostly in four. Spectrum is in seven, you know? And so these things just, this came to me that way with two fingers. Do 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 do. You know, bo ba da bo ba 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 ba. I wanted to show that I could hold a groove. You know, I I wanted to show that I could play odd meters or I could play a ballad and control the flow of the music. It was the music. The recording was designed to be. How can I say a, a template? Uh, what what I what I would uh, say it would was the full, uh, the full palette. Which, yeah, it just showed who I was and what I could do in the studio because I had left the studio to, and, and over the two, two and a half year period of time, I think, or something like that, I was out on the road. I did five hundred shows with the ML, with the MO, you know, and. Nobody, New York, nobody remembers Billy Cobham when she's gone. I mean, for the studio, you know, life goes on and there's all these other cats that are coming through. And I wanted to try to get back in there and just stay home. I didn't intend to go out on the road again anymore. You know, I, I noticed um, years later, you did uh, a cover. This is like in the late 80s of uh, Sign of the Times, Prince Song. And I was curious if you were aware that later in his career, I mean, he was regularly doing Stratus in his shows. Yeah, I have copies of it from him. And Red Baron. So it was, kind of a, uh, it was great salute. But I mean, I love, the reason why I love his music also is that we had one person in, in that I knew of and uh, that we both knew, and that was Sheila Escobedo. And she was my my student for a while uh, when I lived in San Francisco. She lived in the Bay Area, of course, in Oakland. And she was a good timbalist uh, and uh, uh, pop was Pete Escobedo and uh, uncle was uh, Coke Escobedo from Santana. So all of this kind of thing, it was a good relationship to know to know her and to see her grow you know, into to the person that she she became as a as a musician. You know, it was very good, you know, and it was nice to to see her in Sign of the Times. That was that was rocking. You know, I decided I wanted to do something with it myself as a salute, in a way. Yeah, yeah it was fascinating to she, see Shelly E just uh, evolve. You know, I mean, I had mm -hmm. first seen her when she was playing with Duke, and mm -hmm. um, to see where she went was just amazing, and she's still going strong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, did you ever interact with Prince at all? No, no, I never did. Hmm. Billy, so at the time, I mean, you were there at the golden era of fusion, of jazz fusion, you know. Mm -hmm. um, what was your mindset in approaching it, you know, and how did you feel about that movement? I didn't. I mean, it's just... To me, it was just what we did. There's nothing special about it. Just like another musical direction was to was to go. I was told many, many times that it would be 
Oh, fusion is be dead. Jazz fusion is dead. What is jazz fusion? Okay, it's, it's rock and roll and pop or jazz. Or call it what you will. Now we're talking about media, social media, and what they find to be boring after a while, after 15 minutes. Not my problem. It, it's still here. And if anything, it, it, uh, it flourishes uh, without any need for anything because it's who we are. It's in our DNA. And it will be until we're dead. Done. I think it stood the test of time remarkably well. I mean, it still sounds great. Um, sure. And, ju and just the virtuosity, you know, of so many of the artists yes. that were part mm -hmm. of it. Um, you know, I always looked at you as being one of the premier innovators with the drums, you know, just uh, the different sounds and the different kits that you had. And how did you approach that what was your mindset with innovating through drums what you do is you you find out about it what is a drum that's the big question what are you playing on um what do you choose what do you want to have this instrument uh present of your personality so you have to sit down when i say you any any player as far as i'm concerned i know i had to and i continue to do so figure out how does the cylinder work with two heads on it? What are bearing edges? Why would I have eight lugs on this one drum set generally? And how is that different to having 10 on another, six in another? What, what will decide? You decide. But first, you have to understand how it all sounds. And with the right heads on, now, as opposed to back in the day when you only had emperor, ambassador, and diplomat, you have, you have drum heads that only vibrate on the front that you're not supposed to play on. And you have then batter heads. And they're all different ply thicknesses. Just on one drum, and I'm playing on 11 all together. So what happens where not only each drum, how they relate to each other sound-wise, but where do you place them so that you get the combination of, of patterns, musical, the I should say, get the right musical uh, combination for you that you want to present. This takes time and uh, a very strong interest. You must, you must want to do it. If you just want to sit out, you know, sit down with a, a, a drum set that looks good, you can keep the heads on that came with that came with the kit when they were new, without understanding that those drum heads don't sound, they just keep the drum drum shells in round. Quite different. As soon as you take them off, which some guys never do, then you start to play the drums. Then you replace them with drum heads that actually work for resonance in the bottom and at a batter head on the top. Some people just never get to that point. You must have been, I mean, I'm just envisioning, you know, sun up to sundown. You were like doing stuff with your music, right? I mean, did you do much else? What 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 else did you like to do back in the day, if anything? Um, just stay in shape, uh, eat well, try to stay healthy, do things in my life in moderation, but music was my life. How does the drum set relate to, uh, or the, I should say not, or, and anything related like drumsticks, cymbals, how do they all relate 24-7, 365 days a year, except for leap year, all the time? And so you're, you're thinking this. You're not. So when people say to me, when do you practice? Do you practice a lot? I said, yeah. So how long? 24-7. Big, 
silence, question mark. But it's true. Either you're in or you're out. It's not a, it's not a part-time gig. And I mean, that speaks to how prolific you've been just throughout your whole career. And, uh, you know, in the discussion about groove and ballads versus speed and all that, I wanted to just uh, bring this one back in a fold, which mm -hmm. was a, a funk-based <laughs> uh, record you did. And I understand you shot the cover, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're first, not only doing all the other stuff, but you're made. also doing covers. <laughs> yeah, but the first album I ever made was, uh, as I said, was uh, was with Horace Silver, and I shot the cover for that, too. Mm. Yeah, Blue Note. Yeah, but and I continue to do that now. In my albums, I shoot my own covers. So photography would then be another hobby when or outlet. I time, oh, you know how it, it, it's so much connected to the it's the visual aspects of of playing. Sometimes you don't need to. the The, the, the whole objective is is to have a still photograph that provides action. And it doesn't mean that someone has to be running. It's just the presentation of a, of something. Someone could be in the in the in the photo, handing over a loaf of, a loaf of bread to somebody else. But it has to have meaning, you know, with the title or so, the words, and the and the action, the act of doing, all come together. And then when you take that and you interpret it through sound it's a three-dimensional object you know the magic album uh came out when i was in high school and that one you know touched me especially um and i just remember you know hearing the roles you did on that and just i couldn't believe initially that it was you know the drums that i knew as drums you know because uh -huh. it was just so impactful uh the sound you had there uh and um, the closing track, especially, I just love that. And uh, you did so many uh, tracks that had multi uh, multiple parts to them, you know, like suites, if you will. Um, and, and that was one of them. But um, do you remember anything that comes to mind about, you know, your sound, like in the latter 70s and or anything related to that record in particular? The, the dampening of the heads, the, the, the two, the double ply heads, um, that Remo was making primarily only on the edges. So it was like a Richie ring built into the head and it had a rim. It had a, had, it, it, you could see it had a black line that went in a circle. Um, those heads were really the heads that worked best for me because it was control sound. It's called a control sound head. Then there was another control sound head with a big black dot in the middle that Tony used a lot on a in in a Gritch drum set that was like compressed uh what do I call it man it was like chip wood chips I mean it was just like ah oh, it's awful for me the only drum in that Gretsch ever made for me that was a great drum was a 14 inch floor tom everything else I could throw out but that had a sound because of its dimension and its its fly thickness, and it was taking it apart with one of my teachers, uh, the late uh, uh, Fred Hinger, and uh, we were. Fred said, "Let me show you something." And he built me a drum set, and painted it yellow, and it put Gretsch lugs on it and everything, but it was made from recycled compressed daily news and daily mirror uh, newspapers. Mm. I used that on, oh man, what was it? I used it on Total Eclipse. Um, it was really different, very uh, much ahead of its day. And that's what the Remo, yeah, there you go. What the Remo um, Mondo set ended up becoming. They did the same thing, you know. Uh, I found that, you know, you have to know the shells. You have to understand. And the only way you can do that is to try them. The heart of the shell with tone, vibration frequency, if you can find it and you find 
I mean, the best drums I've, I'm, I've ever played are only recently. I've been the Bobinga that, that are made, and uh, of course the, um, the Yamaha Phoenix. Um, as a man, as manufactured uh, on a on a large scale, uh, then there are drum sets drum sets that are made by hand that are of of woods that are very hard to come by that you rarely would ever find as a drum set as wood in a drum set that ha where the wood is matched to tone. And when you get that happening, and you have you have the bearing edges set up in relationship and proportion to that wood, you're going to have something very special. Um, travel could be a difference. Of course, it depends on, on, the, on the, the shell's uh, uh, robustness, whether that shell can hold itself. But some drums never tend to die, even though they're cut, because it's a plant. And you, st you get this whole thing where the drum starts to become a, 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 a living creature you're working with and it's expanding and contracting mm -hmm. uh, just microns and you can hear the tone change with the weather you know uh depends on what you need it for and i have some drums like that too and that i mean it's like for me i i look at myself as being the uh uh a railroad um uh, uh, the chief on a, uh, the, the engineer uh, on a train, and I'm, when I go home, I don't. I, I take the job home with me because I'm trying to figure out what's happening in an eight show set and how that relates to what I do in real life when I'm driving it. Uh, I'm playing the drums. I see what the drums sound like. I hear others play them, and I find that in certain situations. The music has to be lined up with the drums, as are the musicians. If you get every, all of those elements together, it's not just the drums, but the instrument it has to be hooked into the musician, whatever the instrument is, it's, along with the music. The musician has to be able to translate or interpret and present, translate through the instrument, the notes on the page. That's the ultimate objective. Mm -hmm. And then the next words are good luck. You know, it's just the way it is. Well, when you're uh, playing on stage, uh, either now or back then, you know, how much of it would you say is up here versus in here? Well, and it's not in the heart. The heart, the body is a machine. The brain runs the machine. That whole thing, yeah, you got to have heart, yeah, to stay alive. But you got to understand what to do with the heart. It needs oxygen. It needs blood running through it. How to keep yourself together enough to accomplish the goal that you are thinking you need. That's where you got to be. Well, I mean, but though that's kind of literal, but I mean, uh, Billy, like intellectual versus... Um, um, inspiration or um god it's all the same man it's all the same it's only one the body doesn't make the brain go the brain makes the body go it's not it's not it's not technical it's life it is what it is but the sometimes you have to you have to let your yourself go with the feeling though of the music the brain, the brain lets you go but it can become somewhat unconscious or at least seemingly if you're into the body, the body is is the is the actual is is showing what the brain is thinking. It's not the other way around. So it's always coming from the top end, you know? always. Otherwise, my toes would be really really smart. <laughs> but you can, <laughs> but you can you can lose yourself in, in my a, toe <laughs> in, a, in a groove, right? And go chase no, your toes it's later. It's never <laughs> happened to me before. <laughs> oh boy. Well, how about this? How do you uh what would your recommendation be even for other drummers to um, um work up their speed? Like you clearly have tremendous speed, 
uh, but also, uh, you know, be in that pocket and not lose sense of the pocket? Oh, I would highly recommend that any, any student of the art come to grips with the weakest aspects of his or her performance and make them stronger. The thing is, where's the challenge is that you're going to lie to yourself. You not want to. You don't want to go where you don't feel comfortable. And I'm saying, you go where you don't feel comfortable. You're not going to lose what you already do. You're only going to enhance it. Because, I mean, that is just logic. But you got to want to do it. If you can't play two and four, uh, if you can't play one. One, two, three, four on the bass drum and go one, two, three, four, one, two, three. And then right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left, right, left, left, right, left, right, left, right, right, left, right, right, left, left, right, left, and just play through that, sing through that, and hear hear the pattern. So you're 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 synchronizing everything. You're not gonna play that way. You're going to be lacking in that area because you didn't pay attention to it. And eventually, it's going to get you. You know, you're not going to be able to achieve certain things because you cannot multitask. And that's what we do. We're multitaskers in real time. The brain does that. It manages everything in the body. When students ask me, what should I do? I tell them that and they go, you can see the, the smoke go in one ear and come out the next, man. I get it, I get it. They wanna be like me and better yesterday. And that's just what it's all about. And until they get past that, and it's not gonna happen or it'll be too late. Those are the two options. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, because they haven't addressed their weakness. Got to push past the comfort zone, right? It that's it, and that's and and and, and that's it in, in in the ball. Man. You know, you have to go. Okay, I can I play the high hat? Do I even know how to let the the, hop, the top symbol up and down consistently? Can I do that? Can I do that without being a, a hi hat and just have my ankle, uh, ankle and toe, ankle toe, ankle toe? And I play two, three with the right foot and do that and be comfortable with it. And maybe, you know, and everything is in sync. If I can do that, then what? I can, I can play other patterns too. And all of a sudden, it's an everyday thing. It's, it's teaching the body, educating the, mu the, the muscle, muscle education. So things go the way you want them to go, not the body's doing it for making you do something you don't want to do. This takes a uh, focus. Time is not the question. It's how you apply it, how you use the time. Um. In 79, you connected with Wayne Henderson, and you did something a little different, more R&B. Um, mm -hmm. You had yeah. Nate, Nate Phillips on there on bass uh, from uh, Pleasure, the band Pleasure. And, uh, oh, yeah? I didn't even know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, Wayne Henderson produced Pleasure, and, of course, he was with the Crusaders uh -huh. before that. Uh -huh. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. So um, that was just an area you felt like you wanted to expand into and give a try? Well, yeah. It was... Uh... At a point where the the, uh, the record company, I think it was uh, Columbia, they wanted me to do something that was commercial, quote unquote. I wanted to do it too. My problem and, and, and the tunes that I wrote, I wanted to do, but I felt the, the I mean, uh, what was it? I think it was a Herb Alpert tune. It was a Lonely Bull or something. When Wayne pulled that out, it's sort of like, you know, this, it was a big disappointment for me. That's the best you can do as a producer that for myself. 
but they wanted him as producer. Okay, cool. We're going to make this happen. And that was at Ocean Way, which is now now called Gower again. It used to be called Gower before it was called Ocean Way. And uh, I just felt, ah, it didn't really mean that much to me because I knew right then also that they that that Columbia again, this is just throwing another another load of garbage up on the wall to see if it sticks. And if it sticks, okay, we're in, we're in a plus. If it doesn't, okay, we already have you know we're covered already. It was no more, no more for me with that kind of silliness, you know. But it was an educational thing, and so BC the album. Never really saw the light of day very much, and it maybe could have, but it's also my fault to some degree. I was I didn't have my heart in it pretty much. I just felt like I was being channeled in a direction that I really didn't need to go, that I didn't want to go. You know? There was so much of that with the jazz guys in that period. You know, you, <laughs> George Duke and and Stanley yeah. and oh uh, yeah, but George George and Stanley were that. That, well, they I mean, they embrace it more, but but, but so many of the were. jazz, they, yeah, they they could do it. I I mean, they, their stuff, I I buy those records, no problem, mm -hmm. you know. But for me, that wasn't where I was now, and um, I was lucky to to have experienced it to understand that it wasn't me, you know. So let's not do that, you know. Did, did that hasten you uh, moving, going out of the country? Because it was around right after that. Yeah, just right around that time, I decided that I wanted to go and seek my, seek, well, I, I don't know, just see the world, understand better. You know, if there's something for me, it's got to be outside the shores of the United States. Hey, man, I got to go. I'm sorry that I have to cut this off, but I got to mm -hmm. run. I appreciate it. Do you want to just real quick plug uh, anything for people to go check out? Um, Website, uh, that, shows? Um, I'm going to not be in the United States this summer. Um, no, nah, it's okay, because I'm just, I'm just floating right now. I just, I'm in the middle of a concert tour here in Europe. I shouldn't say middle. We're almost done. We're in, we play uh, in Sierra which is in Switzerland, which is, forget even trying to explain it where, where it is. It's up in the mountains. And then uh, we go down to uh, to Paris and we play the new morning, uh, uh, the day after tomorrow. And uh, the next day, I fly to, of all places, Warsaw, Poland. And we play there for a couple of days, you know, um, in a place called Ghost. Um, and that's it for the moment. Working on some recordings, um, that are music minus ones where I, I have my colleagues playing with me, Gary Husband, uh, Will Calhoun, uh, Dennis Chambers, uh, Dom Tremularo, uh, all on the same tune. And I'm, I'm editing and we're, we're all playing my tune with me in different places and I let them play together or they play together. The beauty in it is that it's the same music, two drummers are playing it two different ways in combination um i if you um i can you can see it on on on, on youtube it's um, if you just put me in uh the name of the tune is cuba on the horizon and it's with um gary gary husband me billy problem dennis chambers will calhoun and don Tomularo. and i'm working with that format on other material where we do the same thing. The objective is we have a click. I'm kind of the click. They play with me, and but they play what they hear and how they interpret it. And then I edit, I, I bring them, we play together or they play together. You know, I put Gary and Dom, um, Dennis and Will, Will and, and, and Gary, um, Dennis and Dom, you know, we go around six minutes or so, eight bar breaks, things like this. And that whole feeling is uh, as long as you know what you're doing, you, the music still has meaning and you, you carry it through. You can play together and not be in the same room with each other. 
I'll definitely got to check that out. And maybe you might release something cohesively later. Oh, in the yeah, year, sure. Or? So it will be a, it will be a series. OK. Yeah. Well, fantastic. Mm-hmm. And Billy, it's been so great. Thank you so much for doing this. And thank, thank you, you from everybody watching and listening. Thank you so much for all the fantastic music through these years. We so much appreciate and love what you've given us. Well, without you guys, I wouldn't be here. So thank you very much. Okay. All right. Take care of yourself. Okay. okay you too, man. Thanks. Bye. Nice to be here. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Truth and Rhythm. A big thank you goes out to our guest as well as to you, the viewer and listener. Also, much gratitude to Pleasure for supplying the show's funky opening and closing music. As a reminder, you can always access the complete list of linked shows by episode at funkinstuff.net. I urge you to support this program and receive the extra benefits along with that by subscribing to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube and sharing it with funk, R&B, and jazz lovers, joining Truth and Rhythm's membership program at Patreon, submitting a donation at funkandstuff.net, buying Everything is on the One, the first guide to funk book at Amazon, shopping at the Funky Things store for cool merchandise at funkandstuff.net, and linking through funkandstuff.net for all of your Amazon purchases. In addition, if you're an artist or anyone seeking proven, results-oriented, professional marketing, PR, writing, or editing consultation or production, check out the media services section at funkinstuff.net. Also, I encourage you to drop me a line at scottg at funkinstuff.net. I love the feedback, suggestions, guest requests, appearance and sponsorship inquiries, and just talking about my favorite subject, groove-based music. For now, and as always, this is Scott Dr. GX Goldfine saying, keep on keep vibing, on vibing to the rhythm of the one.